Hi there, and welcome to the Nerds of Business podcast. My name is Darren Moffat. I'm a director at WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency, and I'm your host. It's great to have you with us. Regular listeners will know our vision is to make entrepreneurs happier, and we do it by solving the key challenges that all businesses must overcome. In this series, we're exploring mindset, and in particular, the mindset of the very elite, those disruptive entrepreneurs who are reimagining the world in which we all live. So far, in the previous episodes, we've looked at the positive traits that entrepreneurs use to get to the top, such as resilience, creativity, confidence, and drive. And of course, the positive story of beating the odds through hard work and innovation is the fairy tale that we all love to believe. But it's rarely as simple as that. Running a company is not for the faint of heart. Anyone who's ever taken the truly courageous step to start a business will know that being a boss is sometimes a very lonely, confronting existence. This episode shines a light on the dark side of the entrepreneurial journey. The biggest risk factor is mental health. According to a study by the National Institute of Mental Health in America, 72% of entrepreneurs are directly or indirectly affected by mental health issues compared with just 48% for the general population. That means they're 50% more likely to experience mental health challenges. It can start simply enough with some anxiety or stress. Often money worries or negative cash flow are involved. Insomnia and a lack of sleep can escalate into burnout. And if you're not careful, before you know it, you're fully depressed and unable to function at all. It's not glamorous and it's not fun, but it is something we need to talk about. We also need to talk about another negative factor, toxic leadership. Often, the cause of problems in a business stem from the destructive behaviours of a founder, co-founder or another senior leader. Lies, deception and bad culture in the leadership team can take a massive toll on the fortunes of a company. And this is especially so in high-stakes disruptive ventures. As we're about to hear in our opening story, the bad choices of toxic leaders might deliver short-term gains. But when the inevitable reckoning arrives, it can kill careers, destroy reputations and vaporise millions of dollars. The year is 2003, when a 19-year-old Stanford electrical engineering dropout by the name of Elizabeth Holmes found a company called Theranos. Its aim is to revolutionise medical blood testing. Elizabeth Holmes, like many others, is scared of the needles that are necessary for blood tests. So she sets out to change the way blood tests are run, initially with the idea of a wearable patch. Not only would a patch render needles useless, but by keeping it on for the whole day, doctors could receive real-time information about patients. It's a genuinely brilliant idea, and a lucrative one. The global blood testing market is worth more than $50 billion. Although the patch idea is not technically possible, it does attract the attention of early investors. By 2007, the company is already worth $30 million when she hits upon another seemingly more viable solution, small, mobile blood testing machine. In a touching homage to America's greatest ever inventor, she calls them the Edison. By 2010, Elizabeth Holmes has changed her look and deepened her voice. She begins to wear black turtlenecks reminiscent of Steve Jobs from Apple. Her blonde hair and piercing blue eyes combine with a startlingly deep voice to present a compelling public image. 
She is the epitome of young tech disruptor. The early investors who backed her continue to invest in further funding rounds. Word begins to spread, and famous names such as General Mattis and Dr. Henry Kissinger join the board. By 2010, Theranos is worth a cool one billion dollars. Even though it's never released a product or sold a thing, in 2013, after a decade working in the dark, Holmes introduces Theranos to the world via press appearances where she unveils a website. She almost immediately becomes a media darling. This leads to new commercial partnerships with iconic brands such as Walgreens and Safeway. A year later, with 400 million dollars in new funding. Theranos is valued at a whopping nine billion dollars. Holmes effectively becomes a multi-billionaire thanks to her fifty percent stake in the company. But despite the company's hefty valuation, Holmes remains tight-lipped on how exactly the Theranos technology works. It's soon revealed that the technology has never been submitted for peer review in medical journals. In 2015, the aura around the company and its founder takes a serious hit when the Wall Street Journal run a scathing article. The story is clearly based on sources from within the company and openly questions the validity and viability of the Theranos technology. Holmes appears in other media outlets to do damage control. She claims to be shocked by the Wall Street Journal article. And says that Theranos supplied over 1,000 pages of documentation to refute the allegations. The Wall Street Journal stands by its reporting and soon drops a bombshell that the government health agency has forced Theranos to suspend the use of its machine for all but one type of blood test. By now, it's clear to everyone that the Theranos story is based on an elaborate series of lies. The irresistible narrative of the girl afraid of needles who goes on to found a multi-billion-dollar tech company is, in fact, all a massive fraud. Even her distinctively deep voice is fake. In 2018, a federal grand jury indicts Holmes and her boyfriend co-founder Ramesh Sunny Bawani on nine counts of wire fraud. The U.S. Attorney's Office states that in order to promote Theranos. Both Holmes and Bawani engaged in a multi-million-dollar scheme to defraud investors, and a separate scheme to defraud doctors and patients. Also, the company is soon liquidated, and it emerges that the Theranos technology never really worked. The company actually relied on standard blood testing machines hidden in their office lab to conduct the millions of tests it claimed as its own. If that's the first time you've heard about the Theranos story, I'm sure you're as shocked as I was. It's the worst case of toxic leadership I can find in recent history. The summary you just heard is a highly condensed version of the full saga. As you might imagine, I had to leave out a lot of the detail. But if you want to hear more, I strongly recommend a book called Bad Blood by John Carreyrou. He's the original journalist who broke the story for the Wall Street Journal. The book is a brilliant read and is now being made into a movie by Apple, starring Jennifer Lawrence. As we go to air, the criminal trial of Elizabeth Holmes is currently taking place in San Jose, California, and for the record, she continues to deny pretty much everything, including misleading investors. Whatever the outcome, it's clear her destructive behaviour ruined lives and destroyed immense shareholder wealth. I'm not going to speculate on her psychological state, but in the book, Carreyrou openly asks, "Is Elizabeth Holmes a sociopath?" And it's a fair question. At some stage in the course of our working lives, most of us have encountered a sociopath, even if we might only have recognised it in hindsight. If you're running a business or working as a senior leader in a company, dealing with sociopaths can be a career killer. So. How can you tell if someone is a toxic colleague, and what can you do to minimise the negative impact on yourself and your business? Three, one, 
I love data. I, I love kind of looking through the data. You need to have systems, you need to have structure. You're going to get chopped to pieces. Enthusiasm is unstoppable. We kind of hit a point where we were like, we need another lever. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you. <laughs> this is Nerds of Business. We'll start the show in a minute, but first, an important announcement. Hi, it's your host, Darren here. If any of the topics discussed in this episode today raise issues for you, there are places you can get help. Call Lifeline on 131114 or Beyond Blue on 1300 224636. Stay safe and thanks for listening. So the title of today's episode is When Entrepreneurs Go Bad, Sociopathy, Burnout and the Destructive Behaviours that Ruin People and Kill Companies. It's a very important show today as we take a look at big psychological risk factors for founders and the companies they lead. Because of the sensitive nature of today's topic, we are departing slightly from our usual format. Instead of our usual panel of guests, we're focusing on just one in-depth conversation with an experienced business psychologist. Regardless of the size of your organisation, what you're about to hear is, I believe, a series of incredible useful insights for business leaders everywhere. But first, here's just a quick reminder that if you're enjoying News of Business, to please hit the subscribe button on your podcast player. It means you'll automatically receive each new episode every fortnight and it makes it easier for us to stay in touch. Stephanie Thompson is a qualified psychologist and business coach based in Sydney, Australia, with over 25 years experience helping executive leaders and entrepreneurs to optimise their mindset and performance. She's the founder of her practice Insight Matters and she's regularly in the media, appearing on the ABC, Channel 9 and the Financial Review. So we're thrilled to have her as our technical expert for this series on Entrepreneur Mindset. I began by asking her to explain the clinical definition of a sociopath and she goes on to share the red flags you need to watch out for, coping strategies and even tips for recruitment. Later in the show, Stephanie and I will also talk about burnout, so stick around for that. A sociopath really is just somebody who doesn't care about causing harm to others. At least that's the functional definition. Okay. So we might imagine that as the extreme end of a selfishness scale or an altruist or a people pleaser at one end and the heartless, perhaps evil sociopath or psychopath at the other end. And so it's not about a, an, inability, an inability to empathize. That's a common perception. It's really not the inability to empathize. Often they can empathize really quite skillfully and may have good interpersonal skills. It's just that they don't care about how someone else feels. Reminding me of some people I know, I better not mention names, but (laughs) thankfully I haven't seen them for a long time. Getting to the nitty gritty, you know, like how does this manifest in an entrepreneur or a business leader? Many ways. So a broad heading might be unethical business practices. So for example, lying about a product to get someone to buy it Mm -hmm. or knowing a product is likely to harm people, but selling it anyway, or stealing via corporate mechanisms like using bankruptcy intentionally to get out of paying huge supplier debts or or defaulting on agreements just because they can. Interpersonally, a kind of bullying, it's sort of rather a vicious kind of bullying, would be um, something you might see as well. So what negative behaviours would employees, partners and colleagues, so those who are in close quarters with Mm-hmm. Um, someone in the organisation or the leader who is a sociopath, um, what would they notice in terms of behaviours uh, for someone who is uh, on the sociopathic spectrum? Well, the unnerving thing is that initially, at least, possibly nothing. Oh. In that sociopaths frequently are quite socially skilled. You might, if you're very perceptive, you might notice a little bit of uh, some sense of coldness in the eyes, perhaps. Okay. But with exposure, it starts to become quite clear and you'll see things like high staff turnover. In fact, almost always you would expect that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, 
a bedding in of a toxic culture, actually, because you lose the good staff, the ones who encounter this behavior and say, well, this is not for me. They leave quite quickly. And you end up with a culture that builds into something where the only people that stay align with those values a bit. So the culture starts to go downhill. Um, There can be a particular focus on money and getting more for themselves. Others might lose out, don't really care. Relationship breakdowns would be a theme as well. So sudden, frequent um, breakdowns of relationships, sort of the flurry of angry feathers kind of departure. Um, Because that selfishness uh, makes other people ultimately very angry with uh, the sociopath. So that's obviously disturbing. And um, the thing that caught my attention straight away is the fact that at the start, you might not be able to tell. So... Given that these um, sociopathic individuals, particularly in leadership positions and CEO positions right at the very top, can potentially have serious uh, impact on the business, from a recruitment perspective, what can people recruiting do to try and pick some of this up? Yes. Well, that's an interesting question, actually, because this is a big part of what I do. I very frequently am looking at, uh, psychometrically and in other ways, looking at people to see whether they're suited to a particular role in a particular situation. And there are some indicators. I'm not sure if I want to reveal my secrets, actually, Darren, <laughs> as there are some indicators that you can spot that definitely give clues. And But one of them I can say is broadly there's a spectrum of leadership style that people will uh, admit to quite readily. Yep. And yep. it's an, more of an authoritarian um domineering kind of style but that by itself isn't an issue if they have traits such as um sort of sympathy and positivity and gentler kinder traits whereas if that very assertive domineering style um, is accompanied by negativity and a coldness about relationships, then it manifests entirely differently. So you have the benevolent dictator on the one hand and more the sociopath on the other. It's very different. So we need to look at multiple traits in combination to see what kind of animal is this. And just as as, this is fascinating stuff, and uh, particularly those listening who are employers, you know, um, uh, this will really resonate. Like how often when you're engaged by a company to do mm-hmm. that bit of work on a potential leader or on an individual, how often in your experience, without giving any, any sort of identifying details away, but how often do, do, does it really throw up a red flag? Like, you know, is it one in 10? Is mm-hmm. it one in three? Like, what's the frequency there where, you, where you're really going back to the company and saying, mm, I'm really not sure about this individual? Mm. Well, Quite frequently, the the longer I work with the business, I find actually the first round interviews, which the business may do themselves, they get better and better at sending me better people. Ah, okay. So initially we've got red flags everywhere. Yeah. And then after a while it starts to improve, but there are different kinds of red flags. It's very important to think of this as being a role specific issue. So for example, some very charming, pleasant traits in a human being may mean that that person lacks the resilience to be in a particular role. So in that case, we might say these very lovely traits are actually red flags. They will not do well or be happy in this role. Then there are these harsher traits. And in some situations, we're looking for a bit of sturdiness, a little bit of boldness, a little bit of low low grade aggression, if you like, (laughs) with these these functional traits as well. And we actually want a little bit of that. Now, uh, when it comes to these uh, sociopathic qualities um, mm-hmm. uh, in a leader, why is this bad? You know, so like um, we've, mm-hmm. we've explored, you know, what it looks like and the effects it ha- has on people. But why is it, what effect can it have on a company? A general theme would be mayhem. Mayhem. That right. The culture really rains down from the top. And if you've got this reactivity, um, questionable ethics at the top and you've got this staff turnover that's expensive and you can't keep good staff so it's unstable Um, and 
if it really is manifesting as poor ethics, then eventually the world starts to push back on that. So it could be complaints or negative press or lawsuits. So, yes, just a bit of mayhem, wasted energy. Yep, yep. So mayhem, wasted energy, which uh, obviously lots of things flow out of that, as you said, possible lawsuits, litigation, complaints and so on. But, you know, drilling that down, that will play out into lower efficiency and productivity across the organisation, I would imagine. Yes, yes. Well, it's very expensive having staff wasting their time or spending six months training somebody and having them say, no, you know what, this is not for me. Yeah. And, you know, there's the classic cliche, the two sides of the coin, if we can indulge mm-hmm. ourselves in that for a minute, I would imagine that in some cases it's potentially good to have someone with sociopathic um, traits in an organisation. So maybe um, give us an example of when that might be and, and, and how what positive, positive effects a leader um, with those qualities can potentially have on an organisation. Mm. Well, there's the boldness that can be very beneficial. So the creation of energy. And we touched on the idea of the courage to be disliked. Yep. And actually I made a a little model of the courage to be this disliked, a scale of it. And where we've got at the one end, the people pleaser, altruist and the psychopath at the other. And the sociopath is up on that right-hand side, but they add value by um, just driving things forward, by being unconcerned about being rejected. Things are going to happen. Yeah. So they're a change agent. They're a change agent and they're a source of energy, Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's like, this is what I think, this is what I'm going to do. I, if you don't like it, I don't really care. I'm going to make it happen. That's the uh, the useful energy. Now to a practical question. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly I would have liked the answer to this many years ago when I first started encountering the odd sociopath around the, around the traps. How do you deal with a problematic sociopath? Carefully. No. <laughs> Back away slowly. Hope they won't notice you leaving. Okay. That, that's, much, well, that's, that's exactly what you're supposed to do if you encounter a snake in the wild. You're supposed to actually, mm. I don't know if you know about that, but I'm not making this up. Um, mm. You are supposed to not turn around. You're just supposed to back away with your eyes on the snake very slowly. Right. So yes, same rules for a sociopath then. Same rules, same, different kind of snake. <laughs> yes. So cut your losses. I mean, it, seriously, it, it does depend on context, of course. Yeah. If this, if you're working for one or they're your business partner or it's a supplier relationship, you, you may choose a different strategy. But yeah. cutting yeah. your losses is a factor. A very important element of this, though, in dealing with people with sociopathic traits, and it's a really tough one for ordinary, warm-hearted folk is acknowledging and believing that they just don't care. It's really hard to imagine that somebody will harm others for a profit. Yeah. And so it tends to get dismissed and brushed off. But it does happen. We've seen it across history. So we need to really get that um, and understand that, you know, in exchange for money or power or kudos, they will leave you bloodied on the ground so to speak hopefully not literally wow um yes and well, to, and to make well, decisions accordingly with that firmly in mind and so um let me share a little story with you i'm keen to get your thoughts on this obviously not mentioning any names but i've recently become come across a business in an industry and this business is run by someone who's got a terrible reputation in another industry there's a long litany of uh, litigation and action and complaints and damage and all kinds of things, right? Now, when faced with some, something like that, I would imagine that potentially, how can I put it, engaging that sociopath, maybe trying to uh, bring them to justice or... But if they've mm. done something wrong or you think they're doing something wrong, how do you play... How do you handle that? How does mm. someone handle that in the workplace or in mm. a business setting? Oh, that's a that's a tough question. It's often you'll find in a corporate environment 
they're working within the law. So it's not a case of having to, you know, you call the police and they sort it out for you. Mm. So it, it may still be really very damaging behavior. Yes. But it might be legal, technically. Yes, yes. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Again, I'm sorry for the listeners, it's a little abstract, but um, mm. yes, that's, that's a problem. They are, they're clever enough often to work within the laws. They're not breaking the law. Uh, mm. But what they're doing is extremely damaging and often immoral. But mm. that's a different kettle of fish. Um, so now we come to a question that certainly I've wondered about and I think perhaps many many others have over the years. You know, what? well, there is a, an assumption in this question. The question is, why is soci- uh, sociopathy so common in entrepreneurs and business leaders? But maybe that's a false premise. Maybe it isn't that common. So I, I guess two parts of the question... Is that uh, assumption correct? Um, and if it is, uh, why is it the case? Mm. I think it is correct. My observation is that it's correct. And one of the major reasons is that performance management models in big corporations often select for sociopathic traits inadvertently. Oh. It's that bold, take no prisoners, make it happen, financial KPIs dominating without balancing KPIs, as in key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. Um, When they're all financial, uh, you tend to attract the take no prisoners, do anything to get it done kind of personality. Um, There there is another way to the top often, um, but it's a very contrasting method, which is to be highly skilled, enthusiastic, earnest, all these sort of solid qualities uh, and it's interesting sometimes I find with my clients, I, I'm these very diligent, earnest characters. As they go up the ladder, they're encountering more of these, this clashing sociopathic kind of behavior. Mm. They sort of meet each other up, up at the peak of the mountain. Um, testosterone is, an, is a factor there as well. So there are, as in the drive to get somewhere to achieve um, and high testosterone males. Um, sorry to say this, Darren, because you're clearly a high testosterone male. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. I don't know whether to take that no, as a compliment no. or an insult. Uh, it, well, wait, wait until I finish my sentence. Okay. It? Um, it's uh, yes, they tend to have more sociopathic traits. It, um, yeah. Yes. Um, oh well. It's yes, a, it's uh, high drive. High drive. It, it, yeah. More sociopathic traits. Okay, so there is a, a, yes. um, a correlation there, so to speak. If you've been running a business for a while, or maybe you're in the middle of a difficult startup journey, chances are you've already experienced plenty of stress and anxiety. To some extent, this is a natural part of being an entrepreneur, but it can easily get out of hand. Burnout is a very real risk factor for business owners. Listen to Stephanie as she explains what it is and how to deal with it. She also shares a positive recovery story that's a reminder of hope in even the darkest of hours. So Stephanie, you know, anyone that's had a business for a while um, has probably been through, you know, what I call the ups and downs of the business cycle, you know, and and and, and I'm not talking about the financials here, I'm talking about the emotions, right? So um, burnout is a really big problem with business owners and entrepreneurs. So um, before we get into this too deeply, maybe you might like to give us the, the technical definition of, of burnout. What exactly is that? Mm-hmm. It's a state of exhaustion. Mental, definitely, um, and emotional, perhaps also physically. Yep. So it's a state of exhaustion. And, um, you know, how does this um, manifest itself in an entrepreneurial business leader? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, it looks like tiredness, poor functioning, um, often major shifts in mood, lower usually, possibly um, a wiring of uh, anxiety or uh, irritability. Mm-hmm. So ju- no longer grounded. Yep. And uh, tiredness is a big factor. And so is that a warning sign? So if a business owner is like, Mm. You know, just feeling tired all the time. Is that the classic kind of red button flashing that they should look out for? It is, although the the horse may have bolted by that point, 
intellectually. So when somebody is in that state of um, adrenaline high, so running on adrenaline, the natural outcome of that eventually is the crash, the burnout. Okay. So the the warning light, the engine light should be flashing when somebody's um, burning the midnight oil and, and just overdoing it. Right. Yep. Okay. And, you know, what negative behaviours or feelings an entrepreneur or really anyone notice in someone else who was burnt out? So, you know, the, maybe a common scenario here is uh, business partners. You know, there might be one who's been pushing it too hard, starting to get you know, close to being burnt out. The other one is looking mm-hmm. at that person going, you know, acting a bit odd, what's going on? Like, So what, what are mm-hmm. those kind of, you know, behaviours or, or, or signals that other mm-hmm. people can see in someone approaching burnout? Well, one thing is just some kind of change in behaviour, something that is just different. Yep. And it could be, for one person, it might be a, a, an emotional reactivity, it might be tearfulness, it could be nervousness, or it could be a snappy aggression, mm-hmm. all really founded on quite similar biochemistry, really. Yep. Uh, not thinking so well, negativity is the big one where they just seem to become more negative in some fashion and being off sick, starting to take days off. I guess on the flip side, maybe you share with us a couple of quick tips for how do you get over burnout? Like what, what can someone do, mm-hmm. you know, to, to remedy that and get, get back on back on track? Mm. Well, the heading would be to observe biological imperatives. That's so. nerdy. <laughs> You, you've need you've to... awakened the, the nerd body game. That was extremely nerdy, Stephanie. Yes, please explain. Right. Uh, your needs as a human animal, essentially. So the fundamentals, sleep, food, rest, yep. connection, um, recreation. And the, I mean, a good therapist, of course, is going to help coach therapist. Yep. Of course, of course. And in case the listeners, you didn't pick that up, that was a subtle plug for Stephanie there. Um, but it was very tastefully done, Stephanie. Lovely. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, uh, when it comes to burnout, um, obviously, it, you know, it's self-evident why this is bad for the individual. Um, mm. But what effect uh, can it have on the company they lead? Mm. It brings to mind an analogy of – you may or may not be able to remember this, Darren, but we used to fly. Remember airplanes? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, remember those? And a when long time the. Ago, uh, yes. I know. When the staff do their safety talk and uh, they tell you to make sure that you put your own oxygen mask on first. Yes. And why yes. is that? Of course, because if you pass out first, you can't help anybody else. Ah. Yep. So as the leader of a business, you have to be in good shape. Yep. At least most of the time. Not every minute of every day. Of course. But most of the time. Um, otherwise, yes, it's uh it it cascades down through the business. Um and and yeah, so that obviously I would imagine again would pose the then negative manifestations of burnout are gonna to start to impact on relationships with uh, other workers and, and stakeholders and, and, and the management team and so on. And ultimately, yeah. if it's left unaddressed, that's then going to start to feed into the financial performance of the business. Um, do, you mm. see, do you see that happening often? You know, where the burnout, someone is has let, has really let, let this go on for mm. way too long and it's actually oh, yes. feeding into the bottom line of the business, yeah? Oh, hugely so. In fact, uh, I had a client in um, not not long ago, who actually was more or less ready to quit, to, to close the business, to sell it, to get out, just mm. done, fed up, no longer happy or motivated, mood had crashed really terribly. Very, very consequential. Now, he got a turnaround really fast. It was wonderful watching him, um, actually, and it has ended up at a point where he's got more time to himself and he's expanding the business. He's growing it. He's gone back to this, to creating this kind of legacy that he always wanted to create with his business. And it's wonderful. Um, wow. Yeah. And how, how long did that process take? You know, like to, from say rock bottom, I, I'm assuming he was probably at rock bottom when mm-hmm. you started talking with him first. Like how long did it take him to yes. get, get to that, the top of that sort of recovery curve? 
Mm, top of the recovery curve. Well, I'd say that he was pretty much on track within three months yep. and peaking around about five or six. Yep. Okay. In fact, yes, at, at least that was by the time we got to six months, there was almost nothing to talk about. Yep. And he, he was a particularly uh, responsive uh, student, if you like, of coaching. Okay. Um, and yes, a huge turnaround. So very consequential in answer to your question. If, if the leader of the business or the owner of the business is in a state of burnout, it could threaten the entire enterprise, its existence. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Because, I mean, I, you know, to share some personal experiences with listeners, I mean, I've certainly, I think I've never formally had counselling or gone to a business psychologist, but I, I know that there have been times when I've been burned out or I've been very close to mm. it. Um, and, and I've found that certainly at those points, your tendency to care about the outcome is, is less. You know, you're just like, oh, mm-hmm. whatever, I can't be bothered, you know. Mm. Um, so, yes, I mean, I think it's, it's good that we're all talking about this stuff more nowadays, you know, like it's as a, as a practicing psychologist. I mean, what do you think about this very noticeable change in the culture both in the wider population but also in the business community from, say, 10, 20 years ago. Now people are much more openly discuss depression, mm. burnout and, and so on. You know, what do you make of that? Oh, it's incredibly beneficial. I mean, it's just I, I'm biased, obviously, but it's so fundamental to the experience of life. Yeah. We can be doing all of these things in, in the outside world, but our experience of life is subjective. It's emotional. This is where we live. So the fact that this has become a conversation, it's, it seems so obvious and normal now, at least to me. I, I have a biased view because, of course, everybody I speak to is that way um, or I, I manage to draw it out of them. Um, but, yes, it's, it's so beneficial. We're coming to the end of what's been a fairly intense episode. So before we go, let's lighten the mood with our regular segment, Nerd Under Pressure where a guest has to share one killer hack or tip they recommend for you, our listeners. Okay, Stephanie Thompson, um, you are, of course, uh, our uh, psychology business coaching nerd. And today we're uh, putting you through a very famous segment here at Nerds of Business called... Nerd Under Pressure. Nerd Under Pressure. So... Uh, the series theme is, of course, mindset of the disruptive entrepreneur. And we're going to ask you perhaps the definitive question for this series. What is one killer hack or tip you can give to someone who is launching a disruptive startup for mindset? Okay, so one killer hack or tip to maximize the efficacy of their mindset. I'm going to give you five seconds thinking time. Your time starts now. Remember that the worst thing that can happen, they, they can't eat you. They can't eat you. Can't eat you. Right. Yes. So re- you will survive. You will You'll survive it. You right. will survive. Yes. Life is greater than whatever business venture you're currently being yes. absorbed by. Yes. Yes, it's go for it. So thanks for listening to episode 30 of the Nerd to Business podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a review on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps us climb up the ranks and become more visible to other people just like you. Remember, we want to help as many entrepreneurs and businesses as possible. If you've got a question, awesome feedback we'd love to hear from you you can engage with us at our new website nerdsofbusiness.com that's nerdsofbusiness.com so feel free to reach out and say hello i want to thank our guests today and the team at WebBuzz for helping me put this show together we'll be back in two weeks with our final episode of the series which is on the unique leadership lessons of disruptive entrepreneurs Until then, I'm your host, Darren Moffat, and I look forward to nerding out with you next time. Bye for now.